Today, I'm just going to run a quick through investment basics, basically what you need to know to start. Um, in terms of the presentation today, I'm just going to briefly take you through what is a financial plan, what is an investment plan, personal finance principles that I think everyone should know, why should you be investing the 4% rule, as well as risk versus return, different asset classes, how do you make money when you're investing, exchange traded funds, and just a little bit about my own portfolio. Right, just a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm not a financial advisor. What I'll be sharing is what I've learned and uh, does not constitute as, as financial advice. Please just be aware of that. It's just stuff I've learned on the way and I'm sharing with you and I thought it would be beneficial um, to share with everyone so that you know um, how to start investing. So please just be aware of that disclaimer. In terms of what is a financial plan, a financial plan is basically a, a roadmap. I'd like to think of it as a roadmap that guides you towards your financial goals. It's basically there to guide you towards your financial goals. It's supposed to have, you know, your investment strategy, um, details about how you're going to manage your cash flow. So if you're a salaried employee, a working professional or a business person, what cash flow is going to come in and how are you going to use that cash flow? Are you going to be saving it? Are you going to be repaying debt? Are you going to be investing it? Are you going to cover yourself in terms of um, insurance, just uh, covering yourself in terms of insurance and any other elements that, that might be covered under a financial plan. Now, usually um, this is the components of a financial plan, you know, investment managing, managing your investments, tax planning, considering all tax aspects that might have to do with your investments that you have. You want to be as tax efficient as you can be. It covers your retirement plan. Uh, yes, you, you're enjoying now financially, but what does it look like for you in the next few years, in the next 10 or 20 years when you have to retire? It includes an estate plan. What happens to you if you pass away to your financial dependents? Will your, your financial dependents be covered? Is there enough money in your estate for your financial uh, dependence to be covered, to be adequately covered. And then it talks to what is your investment plan? Um, do you have one? What do you need to be financially free? You know, I usually share financial independence and financial freedom. And this, this concept of your monthly expenses, your, your income being enough to cover your monthly expenses, what amount do you need invested so that your investment income will be enough to cover your monthly expenses. It's about balancing your risks. Um, you know, what level of risk are you willing to take in order to get a certain return? And it's all about beating inflation. At the end of the day, you do want to beat inflation in the long run. Right, so what having an investment plan, why should you have an investment plan? We all need to protect our capital. So money today, won't be the same as money in the future. You know, money loses value over time. You want to preserve your capital in the long run. You want to protect yourself, income protection. You want to be able to meet your expenses as and when they, they fall due and payable. You want to beat inflation. You want to make sure you're covered yourself, life cover for your financial, independent, financial dependence. You protect your assets in the long run. You also want to look at your fees and um, fees that you pay on, on the various investments that you have. Now, there's no point in investing if you're not going to, if you're not going to be cognizant of what, what your investments cost you in the first place, because the cost is just as equally as important as the return that you get on any invest any asset class that you might invest in. And what is your time frame? The earlier you start, the better it is for you. Um, as well as setting financial boundaries. So just a little bit about my own financial plan, and I've, and I've sort of shared this before on Twitter. I always say my goal is to get paid. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a working professional. I do side hustles as well. But as a working professional, my salary should be going towards buying income generating assets. And what are those income generating assets? It's shares, it's exchange traded funds. Um, it's property, it's crypto, it's bonds, it's various asset classes that can give me a return that can at least try and um, beat inflation, as well as leveraging assets to buy more assets. I know the rich do this. So if you've got a property, this is the very basic example. If you've got a property and you bought the property 1 million a few years ago, now a few years later, your property is worth 1.6 and your, your outstanding balance loan on the, on, the, on the home loan is around, let's say, 800. 
Now, because your property is worth 1.6 and, you, and your outstanding balance is 800, if you are able to afford it, the bank can then, you can go approach the bank to afford you to take out money from your bond, um, let's say 400,000 uh, to try and invest in other asset classes to diversify your asset base. That's just a very basic example. Uh, and, and what you want to do when you're investing is to receive passive income from your assets. Your assets should be able to start paying you in the long run uh, some form of income. And for me, I always say if I get dividend income, whatever sort of income I get from my assets, I'm always reinvesting because I've got a certain target to meet. And I'm always repeating this, this process because why? Because I want to leave a legacy for my kids. Now, some personal finance um, principles that I think we all need to have uh, or we all need to know is that, you know, a compounding effect. Money, if you put money away, a certain amount of money, and in this example, I've put in a monthly investment of 500 rand uh, over a period of 20 years with an expected return of 8%. And let's say inflation, and I was being generous here because I know in inflation is a bit higher than what I've put here, which is 4%. In, in let's say over a period of 20 years, your 500 uh, that you're putting on a monthly basis will now be worth 280, 6,000 rand in the long run. So money compounds over a period. If you see in this graph, the gray part is what you essentially put in and the blue, blue aspect is, is basically the growth on what the initial investment that you've put in on a monthly basis over a 20 year period. So just in terms of uh, budgeting, you know, there's this, there's this uh, rules that you sort of have to know, the 50, 30, 20 budgeting rule. It basically says 50% must go to your needs, uh, in terms of your budget, whatever income that you're getting on a monthly basis, 50% must go to your needs, 30% must go to your wants, and 20% can be split between saving or investing. Now, I know given the, the, the current environment that we're in as South Africans um, and, and globally as well, I know our, our expenses are growing faster than some of our salaries. So this 50, 30, 20 principle is just a guideline because we know, I mean, between petrol, food and, and rent or your, your mortgage, those, the, those needs have considerably gone up over the last few years, given the recent interest rate hike. So this is just a, a guideline. Um, there's a 70%, the rule of 72. It basically says, how long will it take my money to double? And I've just put this, this graph here. There's, this is the formula that just says, T is the, the period and how long will it take based on the return that you're getting from whatever investment you have, how long will it take for your investment to your initial investment to double? And basically this, I like this, I pulled this from Instagram. It basically says if your rate of return is 1%, it will take you 72 years for your money to double. And the, the higher the rate of return that you can get from an investment, the less number of years it will take you to double. Now, before investing, it's very important to note that, you know, ideally you want to have three to six months of an emergency saved up, emergency fund. So this is basically where you look at your expenses, your monthly expenses, and over time, I mean, my saving my emergency fund, I mean, takes me a number of years. So um, don't be shy when you hear people saying, oh, I've got my three to six months worth of emergency funds uh, saved up, because it does take a while. It's basically your monthly expenses. Uh, whatever those look like, um, you know, that you, you save for over a period, those three to six months worth of, of, of expenses. And it's basically can be an emergency can be a car breaking down unexpectedly, a giza uh, bursting. It's basically it's a buffer for you so that when you if you're investing, you don't have to turn to selling your investments um, in order to fund to selling your investments in order to fund your emergencies. So having some form of cash saved aside will allow you to ensure that you know you're in a good place financially whilst you're trying to 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 save to to save. The four percent rule. I'll cover that a little bit bit a little bit later in the presentation. And basically, investing in personal finance is about being consistent and being intentional, having a financial plan, and having a financial goal, and sticking to the goal in the long run. Because ideally, if you're not consistent, if you're not intentional about where your money is going, 
um, you basically spend money and you will not know where your money is going. If you don't have a goal, me personally, if I don't have a goal, I, I, I literally, I feel like I'm just maneuvering. I'm just living day to day without having a goal in mind. So having a goal and being consistent towards working towards your goal is very important on, in investing. Now, I know this says dollars, but uh, um, if you can just picture this being in rands, because it's, it's more or less the same. It's basically the 4% rule um, or the rule of 25 that people call it, or financial freedom or financial independent people um, call it. It's basically saying your annual expenses. So take your monthly expenses, whatever that figure is, if it's 10,000 rand, multiply it by 12. So you get 120,000 rand, and then you multiply that by 25. That is your financial independence number. That figure is the figure that you need to work towards financially. Um, that's the amount you need invested um, in the long term so that your investments can give you, uh, can cover your monthly expenses. So your annual expenses multiplied by 25 will give you your financial independence number. And that number is the amount you need invested in order for your monthly expenses to cover, for, in order for investments to cover your monthly expenses. So based on this, it says, if you need, if you need, if your monthly expenses are like, let's say 200,000, I know this is in dollars, um, but if, if you can imagine it's in rands, if you need 200,000 rands per annum, you need to have roughly 5 million invested. And it basically is big, it's based on this principle here, which is the 25%, the 25, um, the 25 uh, rule of 25 or the 4% rule. So it basically gives you a guideline based on your expenses, what, what amounts you need invested in order for you to be able to cover your annual expenses in this column over here. Now, what should be your savings rate? I know for me, if I'm gonna work towards a goal, I want to know how long will it take me to get to my, to my financial goal? So I liked this and this I got from Patrick. Patrick is on, on Twitter, I'll share his details. And he, he runs a blog called called the investor challenge. Now he's also part of the FIRE movement. He believes in financial independence, retire early. So he did this table to say, how long will it take you if you are, if you are saving a certain amount of money per month, how, how long will it take you be, to be financially free? Now, for those people that are, are, are saving, let's say 50%, let's take 50%, raise 50%. If you are saving and investing 50% of your salary, which is, I know for most of us is impossible. I'm just giving this example. It will take you 17 years before you reach um, financial independence. Uh, basing it back on that annual expenses multiplied by 25. If you're putting away 50% of your income, it will take you 17 years. If you're investing or saving, um, if you're saving or investing, you know, 10% of your income, it will take you 59, 52 years. If you're saving and investing 25% of your income, it will take you 32 years. So it just depends on you and how, how much you can afford to, to invest and save. But I know there are people that are doing ridiculous things to try and save and invest so that they can retire early and they don't have to wait until they're 65 to, to retire for their, for, for their investment income to be enough to cover their expenses. So I just thought this was interesting for me to put in. And like I said, there's this point, this crossover point where your monthly investment income will ultimately be able to cover your total monthly expenses. And that's basically known as the crossover point. So why invest? Now, a lot of us are trying to convert earned income, our salaries or business income, whatever your earned income is at the moment into capital. Because your earned income is, is, not, is not determined by you. It's determined by a boss. It's determined by your company. These are factors out of your control. Earned income is a little bit out of your control, especially if you're a salaried employee like me, who's a working professional. You're trying to get it to capital because capital assets have, can earn their return that they can earn is sort of unlimited. And I quote, I put this in quotes, it's unlimited um, because there's an upside. And like we know right now, for those that are investors already, we are all crying because right now uh, the markets are showing us flames because um, of what's happening worldwide. So that's why I put this in inverted commas. You know, earned income is heavily taxed. The higher your income grows as a working professional, the more taxed you are. 
Uh, I know the, the max is, I think is 45% being taxed of your income. That's a ridiculous amount to be taxed. And you're basically trying to get it into capital assets. So dividend income is taxed at uh, 20%. Now, if you're a highly taxed individual whose tax, taxable income is being taxed at 45 versus a capital uh, dividend tax of 20%, you would be crazy not to be happy with that. So usually capital or um, assets are usually taxed less than earned income. And you're trying to convert earned income into additional income streams. I usually share on Twitter my, my uh, dividend portfolio or my dividend income that I'm getting, my passive income that I'm getting from my investments. So I've taken income that I, salaries that I earned three years ago is still paying me because I invested in some of these dividend uh, paying uh, shares. And in the long term, your income will go from capital basically grows faster than salaries. I know personally, from I speak for myself, my salary has not grown up, uh, that significantly over the last years, given what COVID has, uh, the impact of COVID. So my salary hasn't grown that much, it's been stagnant, whereas my expenses have been growing. And I know, you know, over the long term, my assets, which is the capital assets I have, will grow faster than my earned income. Now, um, this is just a table I thought that would be interesting. If you earn, if you investing 500,000 over 20 year period, your final value would be 286. If you're investing a thousand rand, uh, expected return of 8% over 20 years, you have 575 and so on, just based on the figures, right? Um, why do you want to invest? You want to beat inflation. Uh, every investor knows we're trying to beat inflation. And I think inflation, I, I, the last time I checked, sorry, I haven't recently checked what it is, but I know it was between, I think, 5 to 6%. You want to be beating inflation because if you're not beating inflation, your, your money is losing value. If you, if you have money in a savings account that's earning you 2% and inflation is 5 to 6%, you can do the maths. Your money is literally losing value unless it's a short-term um, money that you need in the short term, if you need it in less than a year, it makes sense to have it in a savings account. But if it's money that you know you will not need in the next five to 10 years, why not invest it? We're trying to create additional street income streams through dividend income, and you're trying to draw generational wealth. I know for me, it's I'm the first. I'm the first in my family to have a to have a degree. Well, I was the first before my siblings also got degrees and stuff, but I was the first to ever have a you know a, a great job. And ultimately, I want to create something for myself and for my kids in the in the near future. And taxation, you want to be as tax efficient as you can be. Um, so different asset classes have different returns, right? So I just wanted to show here cash, bonds, commodities. These are different asset classes, crypto, equities. So equity, equity shares or exchange traded funds and property. And basically because they have different risk return profiles, cash, for example, I know I am doing the 350 Rand weekly uh, um, challenge and cash, that cash sitting in time, in time bank goal save account, it's earning around five to 6%. Um, which is okay. Government bonds, I recently uh, joined, or I recently signed up for retail savings bonds, uh, South Africa the, through treasury. And um, I, I chose the top up option and I'm earning 8.75% on my retail bonds. So it's higher than cash, right? So it, the, the higher the risk, the higher the return, as you can see. So cash is right here. Bond, the government bonds have a little bit of higher risk, but they also have a little bit of a higher return. Same as large caps. These are well-established companies like your MTN, your Vodacom, your, your big corporate, your, your JSC top 40 companies. Your small caps like your Purple Group who have a, le who have a market share of less than 2 billion, they'll be, they'll be considered small cap and they'll, therefore they're a bit higher risk because you know, they're still growing, they're still injecting capital, they're still very capital intensive, they're still investing in, in their companies and still growing um, their market share and they're, they're ultimately they're, they're in, in the long run, their share price ultimately. Venture capital, it's startups, very high risk, but also a high, high return. So different asset classes have different uh, returns, like I said. So I just wanted to show here how to diversify your portfolio. You, as, a, as an investor, you want to have different, you know, different uh, asset classes. So you want to have shares, you want to be invested in bonds, you want to be invested in commodities. This is just an example, gold, and you also want to have cash. So you want to, as an investor, you want to be invested in various asset classes and the various asset classes depends on your age 
and um, a little bit of your age, as well as how far to retirement you have and your risk profile and your risk, your risk appetite. So this is just an example. Now, understanding your risk profile, you want to understand what are the risks? I always say this, what level of risk as an investor am I willing to take to get a certain return? What type of investor are you? You need to understand a little bit of, are you, are you, are you a, a conservative investor? Are you, is your risk appetite high? Are you, um, are you one of those that wants high returns, high rewards? What is your risk appetite? And it's just understanding what sort of an investor you are. And this happens over a period of time. I mean, you just don't wake up and, and all of a sudden you know what type of investor you are. This takes time as you're investing in the market in the long run. Now, I just wanted to alert everyone, and this I love this diagram because it, it basically highlights the various tax that arises from being an investor. So your various um, investment types, right? So you have local shares and uh, so via PSG as an example, offshore, offshore shares, offshore unit trusts, local fixed income. In terms of tax, th this diagram just shows, this table just shows tax, tax deductibility of contribution. And I just wanted to highlight if you're in these uh, products, so retirement annuity, a provident fund or a pension fund, you have there is this tax deductibility that you get, which is 27.5% or gr of greater or taxable income. So you do get tax deductibility from your monthly from your from your tax bill if you are invested in these pro uh, products. That's why retirement annuities usually are punted by financial advisors because they say, oh, they can you can deduct your tax, therefore it will lower your tax bill and you you you're, in the long run you'll be you'll be saving on the tax. Whereas your other products, uh, like your, your, your investments, your typical retail investors in terms of your ETFs and shares, you get this CGT. Usually there's a, there's a 40,000 rand. I think the 40, now I'm not a tax expert, but in terms of your tax, I know you get 40, CGT, you get taxed uh, 40%. The first 40,000 rand per annum, you are tax exempt. And then thereafter you pay your capital gains, whatever that capital gains you've, you've managed to, um, to sort of have at the end of the, the tax financial year. Um, and then obviously, like I said, dividend withholding tax is taxed at 20%. Any dividend income you get in South Africa is taxed at 20%. I know in the US, because I do have some US exposure, you are taxed 15% on dividend income, so which is a bit less than South Africa. So there's this thing of, you know, you are taxed now. Like I said in that in that uh, in that table earlier, unit trusts, uh, various things you can be taxed now. Um, tax later, your pension, provident, and uh, retirement annuities are taxed a bit later, so you do save, but you'll be taxed when you retire. And tax neighbor, investment tax free investment accounts, and that's why I always punch tax free investment accounts because it's that one product that Treasury or uh, we are allowed to not be taxed in, as long as we have products in that in that in that bucket. So diversification, usually the common rule is that, you know, in terms of asset allocation, you should take your, the percentage of stocks that you have minus 100 minus your age. So whatever, if you want 60% of your portfolio in stocks, you must take 100 minus your age, and that will give you what percentage of share of your, your overall portfolio, investment portfolio should be in shares. Now, the ultimate guide, I, wrote, I thought this was, was, was very nice. So you need to assess yourself as an investor. You need to assess your, your, the market. What is your time horizon? What is your risk tolerance? Do you want to buy? Do you want to invest in exchange traded funds? I know there are some people that just don't have the time to invest in, the, in individual stocks, but other people are able to do their own research and are able to invest in individual stocks. And it just basically depends on you. Um, how do you make money in investing? I always stress this. There's two ways you make money when you're an investor. Capital growth of your of whatever asset you've invested, your property. Let's say you brought it at one million, it's now one, worth one point six. The six hundred is your capital growth that you have on your on your on whatever property that you have. So that's capital growth. On shares, it's basically the price you paid, the cost price you paid for the share, as opposed to what is trading at now. Now, ideally, you want the cost price that you paid to be lower than the the future value of that share price as well as the dividend income. If you're a dividend investor like me, you get dividend income. Why do companies uh, pay 
or want to create shareholder value, they're sharing, why do they want to pay dividends? They want to share profits with, your, with investors. They want to attract new investors. Why don't companies pay dividends? They're reinvesting back in their company. Sometimes if they're a growth company, they rarely pay dividends. Um, and then ultimately you want to grow your, your share price. Um, uh, how do you also make money? So this is just an example. When I bought this ship, when I bought MTN, MTN was trading at here. If you see this, the average price was 82 rand 97. And um, uh, I think this was a few, a few months back. The share price then was 136. I know it's grown up considerably since then. I would put in 16,000 rand and now the value of my shares, my 203 shares is now worth 27. Thousand. Now, I just thought I would put this in for that militia said, you know, as an investor, you want to have as many shares as you can, but you also don't want to be too, um, too concentrated. So she, in this example that militia shared on Twitter, she was basically saying the number of shares that you have, if for every one rand increase in the share price, of a hundred thousand that you have invested, you will now have, you know, this is what your value becomes for. So for every hundred shares you own in a certain company, the value of those shares for every one rand uh, increase, you now your, your, your price will be worth 200. So how do you live off dividend income? I know this is a US example, but it's very much relevant to South Africa. How much you want to earn per year? multiplied by one over 4% will give you how much you need to be invested in order to live off dividend income. Now, if you have 20,000, if you want $20,000 per, per, per year, you multiply by this, you need to have 500,000 invested in this particular stock in order to, to be able to earn 20,000 rand per annum. So that's just the example. And I thought I would share a little bit of my own personal dividend income that I do get. So I own shares in various uh, companies on the JSC. I have BHP, I have Kumba, the mining shares at Zaro, a PGM, Sibania, MTN, Samtan, Tungela, Grindroid. Now this was at last the last cycle. So my best months to get dividends is usually between March, April, and May, I'm smiling. And then August, September, and October, I'm usually smiling as, as a, a JSC investor because of the shares that I've decided to invest in. Now last, last three months, I've, I, I earned uh, this amount of money. I have so many number of shares in each company. This is the dividend amount that was declared by the companies. And I just basically multiplied this by this and it will give you the total I got. And this was it. And then I just, like I said, dividend is taxed at 20%. So this is the tax and this is the amount I received. Now, as an investor, you want to make sure you're invested before the last uh, date to trade because then you are you can participate in, in the dividend being paid and usually it's a week before the payday so usually like for example BHP the last day to trade was 22nd of Feb and they were paying sorry they were paying a bit later but usually um, this date varies like for example Sibani was last trading date was 22nd of March and then the 28th of March they pay the dividend this is my tax free in my tax free I have core share pref and I have one invest prop and in the last two cycles this is the this is the amount I've, I've been able to receive this is so this is just a practical example of how you earn money now how quickly going to go to, through exchange traded funds exchange traded funds I like to think of it as a basket of shares right your Satrix top 40 the top 40 listed companies are in there. You get domestic, like your Satrix top 40, and get foreign, like Signia, Fora, I, or Koshia Worldwide. World ETF, it's, it's, it's more global, so it's, it's a bit, it's considered a foreign ETF, basically. Now, how I look, what I look for in ETFs, I look at the fees, which is total expense ratio or the total investment cost. I look at what the ETF is tracking. What is the top 40 underlying? Like the Satrix top 40, these are the constituents or the securities that are held in that particular ETF. The resources I like to use, these are the resources I like to use. Um, this is just basically how do you track? So I just gave three examples using uh, uh, Easy Equities uh, ETF Finder. There's a global one. 1200 what does it it's now called fnb but what does it track it will take you it will tell you at the top what does it track the invest uh, one invest um 500 s p 500 what does it track msi what does it track 
then you also need to look at what, what is the total expense ratio? You know, this 0 0.46, that's the global. What is the fund size? The global 1,200 is, you know, this, this it's huge. It's a huge fund compared to the other two funds. What is the total expense ratio? And what is the performance been over the last few months? So you also want to check that and just check. And uh, now, now, in terms of the, the exchange, um, exchange traded funds and their performance, ETFSA usually releases this at every quarter when the dividend uh, payments have been made. And I usually like to look at this and look at, you know, what are the dividend yields of the various ETFs? What have they paid? Is it a total return? Total return means it doesn't pay ETF, it doesn't pay dividend, but reinvest the dividend, reinvest whatever return on your behalf. And over time, that ETF grows. So some of them are not, like if you see, for example, the one invest MSI is a total return ETF, if ETF it doesn't pay, but others do pay. 